Nehemiah chapter 5. In, in the last uh, Nehemiah study that we, we had here, uh, we talked about all of the difficulties that they went through uh, in attempting to just simply build the wall around Jerusalem and how many difficult things that, that, that uh, they, they encountered. And we talked about how similar that is to you when you make a determination in your life to just be obedient to God. You just kind of make up your mind. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Whether it's in your marriage or in your home or in your business or with your finances or with your prayer life or with your thought life or what you're watching or your, you know, your entertainment, you know, or whatever. Just the Lord speaks to your heart, speaks to you about some area of your life that needs to be adjusted. And you would just make that determination. You know, Lord, I'm going to obey. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And, and, and then suddenly you just, you find yourself with all kinds of opposition that is brought into your life in the midst of your attempt uh, to walk in obedience to the Lord. And that's really what we've seen that has happened here to Nehemiah as they are obeying the voice of God to do what they are doing. Uh, Just all kinds of crazy things have been happening. But up to this point, most of the challenges have come from without. In other words, what I mean by that is they've had these outside sources that have been pressing in to try to, you know, stop the work, confuse the, the, the workers, scare them, they've threatened them, uh, and all these things. Now, what we're going to find as we get into Nehemiah chapter 5, that the, is that they're going to begin to deal with internal struggles. And these can be a little more personal, and frankly, even a little more disappointing. Um, and, and we'll talk about why. But here in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1, It says, now there arose a great outcry of the people. These are the Jews. And of their wives against the Jewish brothers. So these are Jews who are bringing an outcry or a word of complaint about other Jews. All right. So this is a completely in-house sort of a issue that they're dealing with. All right. And that's one of the reasons why this can be more discouraging. Because, you know, you expect the enemy to be the enemy. You expect the enemy to be evil. You expect these outside attacks to be kind of what they are. But when attacks begin to happen from within, it can be so much more challenging. And that's what we're seeing here in this passage. And and then it begins to explain why this outcry is happening. It says in verse 2, For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, you can see this is a multi-layered outcry, we have borrowed money to pay the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children, or as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. And it says in verse 6, and this is Nehemiah speaking here now. He says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry and their words. Stop there for just a moment. As if the scorn and the ridicule and the threats of uh, all of those who were angry at the Jews for building the wall wasn't enough. Now they have to deal with issues of an internal nature, and they're bringing all these things to Nehemiah's attention. Isn't it great to be in leadership, by the way? Um, You know, Nehemiah is trying to keep these people on track being obedient to God with all of the things that are happening. And one of the, just one of the things about being in leadership is that <clears throat> people bring their complaints to you. It's just kind of like you're the complaint desk. <clears throat> and so, you know, they, they're, they're coming to Nehemiah and not just, a, not just a small group of people, there's a huge amount of people. And there's this, as we've said, multi-layered outcry. Here's what are, there are basically four things that are being leveled Uh, at Nehemiah here that are going on. For starters, the people were facing a food shortage. 
And we found out in verse 3 that it had to do with a famine that was going on in the land. Famines are never fun things. And so the people are short on food. And when people get short on food, they get short uh, on temper. And, and those things explode rather quickly uh, because people begin to panic. Secondly, some of the Jews were wealthy enough to have stockpiles of grain. But rather than sharing those stockpiles with their less fortunate brethren, they decided that they were only going to sell it. And so those who were needing to purchase grain to keep their families alive during this difficult time, well, they didn't have any money to do it, and so they had to surrender what belonged to them their fields, their vineyards, even their homes as collateral, if you will, uh, against purchasing grain for their families. That's the second thing that's going on. Thirdly, those who didn't want to mortgage their property but still wanted to pay cash for things were having to borrow money from other, again, more wealthy Jews in order to pay their taxes. Boy, we're about at that time of year, aren't we? I've had people telling me about how much uh, they've had to pay this year in their taxes. and Sometimes it's just crazy. Um, obviously, the fewer dependents you have, the more you pay. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to think that some people are paying as much as they are in taxes. But, you know, taxes have been around for a long time. And so, in order to, to, you know, remember, the Jews are under the Persian dominion. And so, they're not paying taxes to their own government. They're paying taxes to a foreign government. Can you imagine? I mean, we complain paying taxes to our own government. Can you imagine how we would feel if we were paying taxes to a government that had stepped into our land, dominated us, muscled us to the ground, basically, until we cried uncle, and then set up a military presence in our country to control us, and then said, oh, by the way, you got to pay. And they could basically charge whatever they want. And usually those tax levies were fairly exorbitant. So some people don't have enough money to pay tax, so they're going to their other wealthier Jewish brethren, and they're saying, hey, can you help me? Would you loan me money to be able to pay my tax uh, to the king? And as a result, they were being charged exorbitant interest rates by their brethren for these loans. That's the third thing. The fourth thing that is going on here that's being brought to Nehemiah's attention is that in order for those people to repay those loans, which they had no money to do, they were forced into slave labor in which they even had to bring their children into play. They had to literally sell their children, if you will, into a forced labor sort of a relationship so as to pay off or to help pay off what the parents owed. That was a very common thing back in those days. Slavery was typically a result of debt. Okay? People became enslaved when they became indebted. And if they had no means of paying back the debt with what they were earning, they had to work for the person who had borrowed them or lent them the money. And they became enslaved because of it. And, and, and the children of these people were now serving these, these uh, more wealthier Jews. The bottom line of this whole thing, and this is what's coming to Nehemiah, the bottom line here is that the poor people in Israel were being exploited uh, and being completely taken advantage of by their wealthy kinsmen. That's what's happening. It's very simple. It's been going on for a long time. But it wasn't supposed to go on among the Jews. And Nehemiah was really upset about this. We'll talk about why here in just a little bit. But look with me in verse 7 as we go on in the text. And Nehemiah says, I took counsel with myself, which is a kind of a fancy way of saying I had to think this thing through. And I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. They are the wealthy people in Israel. The families of nobility and the families who are basically in some sort of an official capacity. And he says, I said to them, 
you are exacting interest. That We would call it today charging interest. So you can just throw that in there. You are charging interest, he said, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them. In other words, Nehemiah brought a lot of people together, and he said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. And it says that they were silent and could not find a word to say. Stop there, please, just for a moment. You know, as I was kind of giving you an example earlier about what they were dealing with, you know, here in the United States of America, we really don't know what it's like to be oppressed by a foreign nation. For, uh, you know, as long as we've been uh, a sovereign nation, uh, you know, we have not had a, a, a foreign nation come onto our soil and oppress us in any sort of a long-term uh, sort of a way. But, you know, Israel, for over a hundred years now, they were no longer a sovereign nation. They were living, as I said, under the authority of the Medo-Persian Empire. They were being taxed by that nation. They were forced to comply with the rules of that government. And they lived to please the king, a king that was not their king, a king that was a foreign king. And now, in other words, what I'm saying is they've been oppressed by a foreign country. Okay? For over 100 years, they've been oppressed by a foreign nation. And now, what is Nehemiah here that is happening? He hears that the people are oppressing one another. And you can see how a leader, particularly a spiritual leader, would get pretty upset about this. These people are supposed to know better, for one thing. But secondly, it's like, look around you. Don't you see how we're all being treated? We're all being treated by the Medo-Persians like we're basically a gnat under their thumb that they can come and squish anytime they want. And here you're treating your brothers in the exact same way when you ought to be helping them and giving them a leg up in a very, very difficult time. Remember, it's a time of famine. It's a time of great difficulty. The poor always suffer in times of famine. Always. The wealthy get by, but the poor suffer. So instead of the wealthy reaching out and saying, you know, hey, how can we help you guys? How can we be a blessing to you guys? I know this is a really difficult season that we're going through. What can we do to help? They're charging them. Oh, you want to eat, do you? You gotten kind of used to that, have you? Well, it's going to cost you. And not only is it going to cost you, it's going to cost you with interest. You know? You don't have any money? Well, I'll take your house. I'll take your field. You got a vineyard? It's mine. You want to eat, right? Fine. You're not growing anything in your vineyard anyway. We're in a famine. Might as well just sign it over to me. You know? You see what's going on? There's a land grab going on. There's greed going on. And, 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 what is worse about this is that the Jews who were involved in this, these wealthy people, were ignoring the covenant that they as a people had made with their God. Because there were very specific things that God had told them in the Mosaic Covenant about how these things should go. Let me show you a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 23, which is an example of this. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother. Interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is typically lent for interest. Go ahead and charge the foreigners. That's fine. But, you, you know, you may not charge your brother interest. That And here's why. Look at this. That the Lord your God may Bless you in all that you undertake in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. This was one of the things God had told the people through the Mosaic Covenant. He, he basically said, listen, you want my blessing in the land. And if you want that blessing to flow into your lives, into anything that you undertake to do in the land, then follow my law. Be a blessing to your fellow brethren. 
when they need a, a leg up, when they need help, don't kick them when they're down. Don't try to make extra money off them when they're having a hard time. Be a blessing to them. And I'll pour blessing into your life. See, what's interesting about this is, this is the, and this is the way Nehemiah sees it. He's, he's sitting here saying, okay, here we are as a people petitioning God on a daily basis for protection. Because we got these people who are threatening to kill us. We got people who want to stop the work of the wall going up around Jerusalem. So we've been praying. We've been saying, dear God, you know, protect us, keep us, watch over us, guide us, you know, uh, with your, you know, your power and, and so forth. And, and they're, they're counting on those prayers being answered. Well, you know what they're praying about? They're praying about whatever they're doing in the land. This is what they happen to be doing in the land. They're building a wall. So God says to them, listen, do you want to be blessed as you do things in the land? Follow my law. Follow the terms of the covenant that I made with you. And what does Nehemiah find out is happening? They're violating that covenant. And at the same time, praying for protection. You know, frankly, this is a complaint that God has and is repeated through some of the other prophets in the Old Testament where the nation of Israel will go through a period of time where they cry out for mercy, protection, and their hands aren't clean. And so God confronts them. He says, boy, you got a lot you're praying about there, huh? Yeah, a lot of things. You need a lot of help these days. Praying about a lot of things. You want my help, but you don't want to give up your sin. You don't want to change your life. You don't want to live a different sort of a way. You know, I, I don't know if, how long it's been since you read through the Old Testament, a book of Malachi. I, I actually love that, that book. It's the very last book of the Old Testament. Next thing you run into is 400 years of silence and then Matthew. But Malachi is a very fascinating book, and, and even though there's no date as far as a way to date the book as to when it was written, Bible scholars generally believe that it was written during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, that those are the prophecies that God gave to the people during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Do you know what the basic premise or the message of the book of Malachi is? It's basically this. You pray to me. You're asking for all kinds of blessings from my hand. And yet you're not living your lives in such a way as to bring about those blessings. God confronted them with several things that they were doing. They were divorcing. The men were literally blowing off their marriages at, at the speed of sound. It was just, it was crazy. And he confronted them with it. In the second chapter, it said, you know, hey, you're, you've, 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 you've taken this, this woman, the, the woman of your marriage covenant, and you've put her away. And then you want my blessing. And then he confronted them about the fact that they weren't giving the, the tithe into the storehouse so that the poor and the Levitical priests could be fed and, and taken care of. And he says, you're not doing that. You stop doing that. And yet you want my blessing on your homes, on your fields, on your... And, and God tells them in Malachi, you know, um, it, it isn't going to happen. The blessings that you're seeking aren't going to happen. And he says to them, put away... These deeds, you know. You're, you're sitting here crying crocodile tears. Why won't God hear us? Why won't God answer us? Why doesn't he receive our offering that we're, that we're offering you know, before him? And God says, I'll tell you why. Because your hands are dirty. Take care of what's, you know, what's going on in your lives. And so that was the confrontation. And one of the other things he talked to him about was that the priesthood was corrupt during the time that Malachi prophesied as well. Let me show you, and this is, this is probably the, this is the, the icing on the cake, if you will. David wrote this in the Psalm 66. He says, I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise, he writes, was on my tongue. But then he says this, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, look at this, the Lord would not have listened, but truly God has listened, and he has attended to the voice of my prayer. Isn't that interesting? David says, I cried out to God, 
you know, but if I had cherished sin in my heart. Now, what is David saying and what am I saying to you? Am I telling you that you better, have, you better be sin free before you're, you, you pray to God? It's not what I'm saying. It's not what David is saying. It's one thing to cherish sin in your heart and to hide it there and, and, and so forth. It's another thing to confess it. That's what God wants out of you and I. Just in case you were wondering, we look at the sin of our lives and we think God wants us to clean it up. The fact of the matter is, you don't have the power to clean it up and neither do I. We can recognize it. We can turn from it and we can pray to God because of it. And we can give it to the Lord that his work might be accomplished in our life to bring about a real change of our behavior. But ultimately, there's nothing you and I can do in and of ourselves, I'm saying, you know, to just kind of grit our teeth and get over it. Or, you know, God doesn't come up to us and say, hey, buck up and, and just, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It's time to get over this sin issue you got going on. Because we all deal with sin. We all deal with weaknesses and failures. Here's the point. Are you willing to admit it? That's what God wants out of you and I. He wants that admission that says, Lord, this is sin in my life, and I am powerless to change this apart from you. But with your power flowing through me, your Holy Spirit working in my life, this, this can change. There's hope in you, Jesus. There's hope for me to find victory over this area of sin in my life, whatever that thing may be. The power is through Jesus, not through you. You don't have that power, right? So you see, when it comes to sin, he just wants us to deal with it. At the, at the foot of the cross, humble ourselves and not cherish it. And that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? To cherish it in our hearts. What's the, what's the word picture you get there? It's, 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 this is kind of, I see somebody in the spring and summertime of their sin where they're just kind of having a good time. And they're not ready to talk to God about it. They're not ready to confess it. They're not ready to ask God to forgive them. They're not ready yet because they haven't, you know, felt the sting of it yet. Because, you know, the Bible says sin is enjoyable for, what, a season, right? And then after that, what happens? It's not enjoyable anymore. And, and then it's, it's just horrible. And it stinks. And it rots. And it, and it you know, then, we, then we're all too anxious to bring it to the cross. But there's that period of time in our life where we actually think, I think I'm getting away with this. And we'll hold back, even though we're convicted. We'll hold back. You know, David even writes another psalm where he talks about how he held back confessing his sin. And then he talks about what it was like when he finally got around to confessing it. It's like taking a house off your shoulders, isn't it? You know, when you're under conviction, oh, that is just a terrible existence but then just to bring it to the cross jesus you know this is me and you know look at look at this sin in my life and i confess it to you and lord i confess to you not only that this is sin i confess to you i can't change this thing i confess to you that i am powerless to change it but i'll tell you one thing i'm not going to do i'm not going to cherish it in my heart anymore and the way that's going to change is I'm going to start to let the light of your presence shine into that area of my heart. I've kept it closed off in the dark, where sin likes to grow, by the way. But I want to begin to let the Word of God shine into my life related to that area of sin. That's what God's looking for in our lives. And, yeah. So let's keep going here now. Verse 9. So I said, this is Nehemiah speaking now, the thing that you're doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants, are he's admitting here, we're also lending them money and grain. But now let us abandon this exacting of interest or charging of interest. Nehemiah uh, tells us here that he too was one of the people who was actively involved in lending money to poor people, but he wasn't charging interest. And so what he's saying to them is, 
follow my example in this thing. I'm doing what you guys are doing. I'm lending money too to these poor people. But no interest, you guys. Stop it. Let's knock it off. So notice, notice the reason here in, in verse 9 that he gives for them doing what is right. He says, ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? The fear of God. What is the fear of God? It's just, it's just the understanding that God sees and he knows and he will hold us accountable. You know? It's not a, it's not a cringing fear, you know, like the scarecrow in front of, you know, the Wizard of Oz, you know, every time he's talking. It's not that kind of fear. It's just the, it's, it's the thing that, that guides us through life and keeps us from doing what is wrong because there's a God. There's a God in heaven. And he holds men accountable, you know. In, in our case, as children of God, we know that our sin isn't going to be punished in an eternal sort of a way, but yet God still disciplines those whom he loves. And I'm inviting the Lord's discipline if I'm just going to, you know, do what ought not to be done and so forth and not fear the Lord. So what are they supposed to do? Verse 11 is now where Nehemiah gives them some specific direction. Verse 11, return to them. And notice the immediacy of it. The urgency of it. This very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money. And that's referring to the interest of whatever. Money, grain, wine, oil, whatever you've been charging interest on that you, you know, do, you know, return it and return it today. Why do you think Nehemiah is calling for an immediate response of the people? Well, you know, first of all, repentance needs to be immediate. But second of all, if you stretch things out, our sinful nature being what it is, we lose our resolve so quickly, you know? And we'll put things off that otherwise ought to be done. I mean, let's face it. When you are being, when I'm being convicted of, of, a, of a sin in my life, my natural response is to put off repentance, you know? Until I'm particularly... I reach a certain level of, you know, miserable. But that's just the way we go. We'll put things off. We'll put it off as long as we possibly can. Nehemiah is a good leader, and he knows human nature. And he says to them, guys, here's what you need to do. This very day, return their fields, their, their homes, their olive orchards and whatever else, and the interest, return it to them. Give it back to them. Verse 12, and then he said, uh, then they said, rather, here's their response. We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And, and that's a good response. But then Nehemiah goes on, he says, and I called the priests and made them swear to do as they would promised. I don't know about you, but that to me is a bad thing. You know, when you have to go to the, the priests, those who are in charge of the spiritual lives of the people, and you got to make them swear to obey God, you can see how far down we've gone. You can see how you know, discouraged, potentially, Nehemiah could become by looking at the religious leaders of Israel, and, and he can see that their hearts just aren't in it. And so he's like, hey, guys, swear to me you're going to do this. Swear to me you're going to you know, be obedient to this thing. All right, we swear. You know, it's not a good sign. Verse 13, and then to kind of illustrate this whole thing, he says, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. Fortunately, we see here that last statement is the people really, truly were genuinely touched with a, with a heart of repentance. And by the way, it, the word repentance isn't used in this passage, but this is repentance. This is, this is repentance. You want to know what, re what repentance looks like? It looks just like this. It's turning around and going the other way. You're heading north, turn around and go south. If you're heading east, you turn around and you go west. 
It literally means a change of mind. But if there isn't a change of direction to go along with that change of mind, then you're just playing games. So these people are literally saying, we're going to stop doing what we've been doing, and we're going to actually even return what we had taken. Verse 14, Nehemiah goes on and says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor. Now, this is brand new. We never heard this before. He came to oversee the building of the wall. Now we find out he actually becomes the governor. By the way, that's the highest position in the land because there is no king anymore. Kings aren't happening, right? They're only governors under the Medo-Persian rule. And so here's Nehemiah. He's been brought to the position of governor in the land. And he says here, he, he says, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. You might say, well, well, that's kind of dumb. He didn't eat the food that was given for the governor to eat, and he just let it go to waste. No, that's not true. See, the food allowance of the governor was taxed from the people. What, what Nehemiah is saying is that during the entire 12 years that he was governor, he never took advantage of the levy or the taxation that, that was demanded of the people to feed the governor and his household. And his household was no small thing, as we're going to um, see here. But in verse 15, he tells us that the former governors, or the governors of the land that came before him, he says, you know, they laid pretty heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration of 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, the servants of the governors. But he says, I did not do so because of why? What does it say in your Bible? Because of the fear of God. Because he feared God. You know, here's the interesting thing. This is a right that he had according to the edict of the king. The king basically said, listen, the people must pay this amount of money to support the governor. Now, supporting you know, government officials is not wrong. You know, There really isn't fundamentally anything wrong with that. These people have devoted all of their time and attention to the work of governing, and so it really should be the, the job of the people to you know, pay a, a fair wage to these individuals. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet, Nehemiah didn't, t didn't take it, didn't accept it. Why? Because he wanted to bless the people and because he wanted to express his fear of God. Verse 16, he says, I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land. And all my servants were gathered there for the work. In other words, and it sounds like sometime during the course of the construction on the wall, at some point, Nehemiah became governor while the work was still progressing. And the very real temptation of a government leader is to kind of say, well, I have work to do administratively, and, um, you know, so I really shouldn't be here getting my hands dirty with all this menial labor. Obviously, that's for you people to do. So I'm going to just kind of head back to my office where it's air-conditioned and they're bringing me, you know, lemonade on the hour and I'm just going to kind of chill and just be the governor, right, that everyone kind of expects. Notice what he says here. He says, we came to work. As governor... When it was time to get up in the morning and to go out to the wall and start working, Nehemiah went out and worked right alongside everybody else. And so did his officials as well. He said, boys, we're going to work. You know, put on your work dudes, the duds, whatever you put on, and we're going to go and we're going we're to put in a, a day's labor today. Verse 17. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men. Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days, all kinds of wine in abundance. 
Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. So the governor's house fed a minimum of 150 people a day. You can imagine, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of food. And he's saying here, I paid for it out of my own pocket. As the governor, I had the right to take the tax from the people, to take care of these financial obligations, but I paid for them out of my own pocket. And then he ends the chapter simply saying in verse 19, remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done to this people. And that's a, a common refrain for Nehemiah. Chapter 6. Now, more opposition from without. When Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates yet, Sanballat and Geshem said to me, or sent to me rather, saying, come and let us meet together at uh, that place there, Hecaphirim, in the place of Ono. But he says here very clearly, they intended to do me harm. Remember, he was the governor of the land. Do you guys remember? The governors of the land didn't always fare really well with people. Do you remember in the book of Jeremiah, the very first governor of the land, who was a godly man, Jeremiah liked him very much. He was assassinated. So the threat of being assassinated was very real, right? And Nehemiah knows that these guys are trying to under the guise of official business, you're the governor now, they sent him this official message, probably on their, you know, official letterhead, saying, uh, please join us at this special location where we're going to be having a meeting. And as governor, you certainly are going to want to be there because, uh, you know, this is official business. So, but Nehemiah says, I, I knew what they were doing. They wanted to harm me. They wanted to kill me. And he knew and understood that. Look what he says in verse 3. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner. So they didn't stop. They were relentless. They kept sending messages. Nehemiah, come and join us for this special official meeting of all of us leaders. And he kept saying over and over again, hey, I'm in the middle of doing this work. Wouldn't that be great if you and I had that same attitude about obedience to God? And we would say, whenever there was some kind of a distraction, I am busy doing the work of the Lord. Why should I stop doing the work of the Lord to go down and, you know, fiddle-faddle with you and waste time when there's this work that needs to go on? Wouldn't that be incredible? Think about the things that distract you in the area of your obedience from God. Just think about it. In your own mind, what are, what are the distractions? What are the things that draw you away? Or at least have the potential of drawing you away? You know, I could probably come up with a bunch of them here. I won't, because they're fairly personal, but I could think of things, believe me. Wow. What if every time those things knocked on my door, I said, hey, this is the work of the Lord going on. Why should I stop doing the work of the Lord? To go and waste time with you. Verse 5, it says, In the same way Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was, in it was written, It is reported among the nations. And Geshem also says, says it. That's kind of like say, you know, saying, I heard it on the internet, so that means it's true that you and the Jews uh, intend to rebel or something like that. Uh, that's why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, we're hearing that uh, you want to become their king. And uh, furthermore, as far as we can see, you seem to have set up some prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And they're telling him, you know, the king, Artaxerxes, he's going to hear these things. We better get together and talk about this because uh, we need to talk about what to do, what to say when this thing all comes apart. Because uh, if we're not on your side, if you, I mean, 
If this is false, Nehemiah, don't you think you probably better get with us and tell us and convince us that it is so that when, when the king asks us about it, we can say, no, 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 no. That's not true. Nehemiah would never do something. Don't you think you probably better, you know, exonerate yourself from any kind of uh, rumors that are going on in this sort of a way? Now, what are they doing? They're kind of expressing to Nehemiah this. They're trying to get him to um, fire up this self-defense mechanism that lives inside of all of us, you know, that makes us afraid that if we don't do something, some really bad stuff is going to happen. And, and, it, and it lives inside of all of us, you know. You know, I think you're in trouble, buddy, so uh, you better, we want to get together with you and see if we can't maybe diffuse this thing before it gets out of hand. And it's just a ruse. There's nothing true about it. But even though we know sometimes that things aren't true or don't really have any bearing in reality, sometimes just that self-mechanism, self-defense mechanism or self-preservation mechanism will just kind of snap to and, and we'll just like, oh, okay, I got I to gotta do this. I love how Nehemiah just holds his ground. Look at verse 8. And then I sent to him saying, you know, no such thing as you say have been done. You're just inventing this stuff out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, he says, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. What I love about Nehemiah is he's a man who has discernment enough to know this is a baseless attack of the enemy and when there's a baseless attack of the enemy, there's no reason to get all up in a lather. Just trust God. Put your trust in God, you know. Just don't get upset and don't get into panic mode. Do you know the enemy wants to get you into panic mode? So that you'll just kind of, you know, when we're panicking, you know, we, we do all kinds of really, really dumb things. And I really love this example in Nehemiah that he just has a cool head. And first of all, he sends a letter back and goes, you know what, first of all, this, you, just, you made all this stuff up. This is, this is a figment of your imagination. There's no, this is baseless, you know, fiction. First of all, you know. But, you know, he says, I, I, I know what's going on. And then he prays. I know, I know what they're trying to do. They're just trying to frighten us so that we drop the work. We, we, we cease doing the work. So he prays, God, strengthen my hands. Oh, that we might pray when, when panic begin to set in. Verse 10. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. Now, what he's suggesting that Nehemiah do is to go into the temple and basically hide himself in there uh, so that these people who are wanting to assassinate him. Now, this is, a, this is a Jewish official who's telling him to do this. This is somebody who ought to be a friend, you know, right? Again, verse 11, look at Nehemiah's response. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And, and by the way, what man such as I could even go into the temple and live? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go hide. I'm not going to go hide, uh, you know, in the, in the Holy of Holies or something like that, just so these guys aren't going to come in looking for me. I'm not going to do it. And, and he said, I'm not going to run away. He says in verse 12, And I understood and I saw that God had really not sent him at all to say these things, but he had actually pronounced this, prophecy, if you will, against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had actually hired him. He was, a, he was a man for hire. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And then when I sin, then they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Oh, does the enemy loves to do that. Get you really scared so you do something stupid. Then I can tell everybody how stupid you are. 
Enemy loves to do that. Rather than you and I just saying, I will trust God instead. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm not going to become afraid. Verse 14. I love his prayer. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid but were just on their payroll. Verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us, they were, it was their turn to be afraid. And they fell greatly in their own esteem. Isn't that an interesting phraseology? They fell in their own esteem. In other words, they lost confidence in their ability now to hinder and hamper what was going on in Jerusalem because they realized God's in it. That's, that's the thing. They realized God is in it. And it says they perceived that the work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They knew that, that it, this, you know, as much as they tried to stop it and it never stopped, this it had to be God. Moreover, verse 17, in those days the nobles of Judah, and again, this is the nobility, they sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. So they're passing letters back and forth. For many in Judah were bound by oath to this Tobiah guy because he was actually, and we find out here in verse 18, he was related to some of the Jews. It says he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah. And then in his son, Tobiah's son, Jehohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. So you can see that Tobiah and his son had married into Jewish nobility. And it's because of that, some of these people had sworn an oath to him, even if it meant going against their God. They were willing to risk the covenant relationship with their God to support this Tobiah creep because they were related. And it says in verse 19 that whenever they got together with Nehemiah, these nobles, it says they always spoke of his good deeds in, in, in my presence. They were constantly telling me, oh, he's a good guy. He's a, and they would tell me, oh, you know, he likes the poor. He loves the poor. He works really diligently to help the poor. He's a good guy. He's a good man. He's always doing good things. He just... He loves to do, he's helping the widows. And so, and, he's, and they, it says, and they were constantly reporting what I said, Nehemiah says, back to Tobiah. Everything Nehemiah knew and understood. This guy is not a fool. He knows that whatever he says in front of these nobles who should be on his side, he knows it's going to get back to Tobiah. And he says, and Tobiah continually sent letters to make me afraid. And that pretty much explains whether Tobiah really is a good guy, doesn't it? Yeah, he was a creep. But anyway, that's where we're going to stop for tonight. Boy, you know, doesn't it just kind of, it, it's, it's almost frustrating to read some of this stuff, you know, because he's just, you think, why do bad guys have to be so bad? You know? Why don't they just grow up and... But you know, we find out in John's Gospel, John says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness because their deeds were evil. Because of that, they didn't want to come into the light for fear that they would be exposed for who they really are. The bottom line, you guys, is people like darkness. They like it. They like it. And when the light shines through you in your obedience to God, they don't want to see that light because that light does not reflect well on them. They're trying to evade the light as best they can. And, and, and the last thing they want to do is see it in you. So they're not going to like you. They're, they're, going, to, they're going to want to oppress you. They're, they're going to want to try to get you to dim your light. And you can see that's what's happening to Nehemiah here. 
They're, they've been trying all these different end around, you know, different sorts of option plays and this and that to try to get Nehemiah to compromise. The enemy wants you to compromise your life. You know why? Your light doesn't shine as bright in the midst of compromise. Compromise has a huge dimming effect to our Christian witness. And so the enemy, you know, is obviously a tool that he wants to use very much. I'm going to get you, you know, <clears throat> right about that time when you're telling people, like on Facebook, for example, that you're a Christian by, you know, posting verses, which, by the way, is a good thing to do. I, I think it, if you're a believer and you're on Facebook, you should be posting Scripture. I think that's a great thing to do. But just know this. The enemy is going to work on you when he sees you being obedient to God so that somebody's going to like say something and you're going to come back with this total fleshly response. And he'll get you to compromise. You know, because you've been saying all these things that are true about God and then you're going to come out and just lambast somebody. Just absolutely just this, this vicious sort of a response. Who are you to... You know, and then suddenly everybody's going, oh, yeah, light's not shining so bright here now, is it, Mr. or Mrs. Christian? You know, that's the enemy's M.O. He likes to do that. That's what they're trying to get Nehemiah to do. Run, hide. They're going to get you. Hey, I got work to do, man. I got work to do. And when the people are saying things and rumors are flying and they're saying, I understand that you're actually leading a rebellion here. That's, I mean, that's just the scuttlebutt around town. You're actually kind of leading a rebellion, and we hear that you're getting ready to proclaim yourself king? Does that sound familiar? Oh, the, 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 the natural sort of a tendency on our part to defend ourselves at that point, to step up and, and just, you know, say what we need to say, to call these people who they, what they are, and, you know, and try to shut them up and... And, and, and yet, what we end up doing is we end up compromising our walk with the Lord in ways that just kind of bolsters these beliefs. You know? When you are under attack, put your head down and walk forward in obedience one step at a time. There, there are days when you just have to do that. Sue and I were talking about this out on our walk today. <laughs> I was telling her, you know, there's, there's those times, and there's been times in my life when there were attacks coming from all over. And sometimes, you know, you can sit and you can, you can answer every attack and you can try to put out every fire. But you know what? That's going to dominate your time. You know? You're going to be writing notes on Facebook or emails or, or tweets or whatever, however you do, and you're going to be putting out all these little fires about all these things that are Going on. Or you can put your head down and you can say, this is the road that God has ordained me to walk on right here. This is the road of obedience right here. I'm going to put my eyes on obedience to the Lord and I'm going to walk it out. And I'm going to let God handle the fallout from all these other things. I'm just not going to get involved, you know? That's what Nehemiah is showing us an example of here in this passage. Just walk it out. Be obedient, you know, glorify the Lord.